morning. Good to be with you all. I invite you to turn with me in your copy of God's Word to the Gospel of John as we continue in John chapter 1, looking this morning at verse 29 through 34. John 1, 29 through 34. And as you're turning there, let me just uh, remind us of the announcements this morning in the bulletin. I uh, just wanted to make you uh, aware specifically of the study on the deacon, uh, the deacon study that's going to be starting next Sunday. Uh, that is going to be through video uh, meeting, Google, Google Hangouts or Google Meets. Google Meets. And uh, if you are interested in joining that, if you could please let Ken know that you are interested just because he has to make sure he's got all the contacts and things like that. And also, if you're interested, this is the week to get the book since it is fast approaching. So just wanted to mention that. John chapter 1, beginning in verse 29 and reading through verse 34. This is the word of God. Let us hear it with reverent and attentive hearts. The next day, John, that is John the Baptist, saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who is preferred before me, for he was before me. I did not know him, but that he should be revealed to Israel, therefore I came baptizing with water. And John bore witness, saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and he remained upon him. I did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, Upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and testified that this is the Son of God. Amen. Let us unite our hearts in prayer as we go to God and seek His help as we come to the preaching of His Word. Let's bow our heads and unite our hearts. Father, as we come to Your Word, we pray that You would give us eager and hungry and thirsty hearts to hear the truth. Father, we pray that Your Spirit would be our teacher, that He would enlighten our hearts and our minds to behold the glories of Christ. Lord, that we would grow in our knowledge of Your Word, that we would grow in our knowledge of how You have planned and accomplished and applied redemption to Your people. Father, we pray that we would glean uh, many, many lessons and examples from John the Baptist himself in his faithfulness, in his faith and trusting and believing your promise and your word. And Lord, we pray that we would heed John's message to look to the one who came after him, who is to be preferred before him, and indeed is to be preferred before all others, your son, in whom you are well pleased. Father, be our help. We pray, Lord, for those who don't know Christ, that you would remove the scales from their eyes. Lord, that you would give the gifts of faith and repentance. Lord, we pray that where there is opposition, you would grant willingness. We pray, Lord, that you would be merciful to the sinner who is outside of the safety of Christ, who is still yet dead in their trespasses and sins and standing under the wrath of God. We pray that through Christ, they would experience genuine deliverance from sin. Lord, as we've read in Exodus and Your deliverance from Egypt, we pray that they would experience the greater Exodus through Christ, through His shed blood on the cross of Calvary, His burial, and His resurrection and His ascension to Your right hand, where He intercedes for all His own as our great High Priest, pleading the merits of His work Father, we thank You for the comfort that not one of Your people shall fall away. That those whom You foreknew, You also predestined. And those whom You predestined, You called. And You justified and glorified. Father, we pray that as we find ourselves still in the midst of that great chain, having been justified and yet having not yet been glorified, we pray that You would encourage us 
Lord, we pray that your spirit would be our comforter, that he would be our helper as we imitate Christ and we walk this Christian pilgrimage. We pray that we would look to the spirit who helps us, the spirit who gives us his aid and works in us all the graces. We pray, Lord, that you would be gracious to us. Bless your people, Lord. Give us joy in worship today. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I want to start off with a brief clarification as we um, consider our text this morning. And honestly, this doesn't really have any significant effect on the meaning of the text, but it is just something for us to be aware of for our own knowledge and understanding John's, uh, the flow of John's gospel. Um, The heading in my Bible calls this section, John's Witness at Christ's Baptism. And I don't think that that's quite correct. Um, You'll notice as we read that John actually doesn't give an actual account of Jesus being baptized. Instead, he records for us John the Baptist's testimony regarding what he witnessed at Jesus' baptism. And that raises the question of the timing of this passage. So when John the Baptist here says to these crowds, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world... Is that something that John said just before Jesus steps into the waters of baptism? Or has Jesus' baptism already happened sometime in the past and John is now giving this testimony sometime later? And I believe that there are compelling reasons from the text that would indicate that this is John's testimony not at Christ's baptism, but rather after Jesus has already been baptized and has gone into the wilderness to be tempted, and is now returning at a later time to John. Now, the reasons for that, unfortunately, get lost in the English translation of the verbs. And uh, you know me, I, I do not like to make a point that rests solely on a language that I know most of our people cannot read for themselves. Um, so I'm just going to make my argument as concisely and hopefully as non-technically as I can. And it's going to be very simple. Basically, I'll I'll keep it as simple as this. The the tenses of the verbs that John uses indicates that he is speaking of events that happened prior to this day. Okay, so if you look at verse 31, literally, I think it should be translated, I had not known him, but that he should be revealed to Israel, therefore I came baptizing with water. Now, saying, I had not known him, indicates that at a time in the past, John did not know who Jesus was, but that from the vantage point, as he is now speaking, he does know him. Meaning that this is not John the Baptist's first encounter with Jesus. Or again, if you look at verse 32, literally, I have seen the Spirit descending upon him like a dove. Now, that to me seems like something of an awkward thing to say, to say, I have seen the Spirit descending upon him like the dove, if he's speaking to the crowd who has just witnessed the very same thing. It seems like it wouldn't need to be said if if this were the actual event of Jesus' baptism uh, itself. But those things aside, these are some indicators that I think would indicate that this is happening sometime later from Jesus' actual baptism. And John is now looking back on what he saw that day and giving testimony to the crowds that are now present. But with with that aside, just a clarification, let's consider first the exposition of our text this morning. And in terms of, if you'd like to take notes, I have two main headings under our exposition. And so let's begin with what I'm calling John's description of Christ. John's description of Christ. If you look at verse 29 where we begin, he writes, the next day, that is the day following the interrogation that we considered last week, The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. No doubt one of the most famous lines from all of Scripture. Jesus is the Lamb of God. Obviously highlighting for this Jewish audience the themes of atonement and the theme of sacrifice. Any Israelite who is standing in this crowd upon hearing these words would instantly have 
Old Covenant imagery running through their minds, and they would be thinking about how it is the Lamb without blemish that is offered daily as a sacrifice for the sins of the people of Israel. Uh, They would have running through their minds the imagery of the Passover, where it was the Lamb without blemish that is sacrificed in order to protect the Israelites from the angel of death. And John the Baptist announces to them that in Christ there is a new Passover. There is a better sacrifice. Hebrews 10 verse 4, the blood of bulls and goats could never take away sin. Those things were all temporary and they were all ineffective in themselves because only one like us Born of a woman, the Word becoming flesh, as we saw in verse 14, only one like that can take away the sins of men. But notice, He's not just the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of Israel. He's the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And just in case there are any cage stage Calvinists in our midst this morning, we shouldn't blush at the language of Scripture when it says that Christ has come to take away the sins of the world. This is not a denial of particular redemption. It does not nullify the fact that Christ came to save a particular people through His life and death and resurrection. But it emphasizes that Christ comes as the Savior not just to Israel, but to bring salvation and redemption to the ends of the earth. And to bring salvation to every tribe and tongue and people and nation. We we need to be clear about that in our offer of Christ to sinners. The Gospel is exclusive in terms of Christ being the one and only way to heaven, but it is not exclusive in its offer to any one particular people or any particular type of people. If you are a sinner living in this world, it does not matter where you are from, it does not matter in what time you live, Christ is the appointed Savior of the world by whom you must and will be saved if you call upon His name by faith. So He's the Savior of the world, but also notice John says in particular, He has come to take away sin. That is, He has come to take away both the power and the penalty of sin. And that language, take away, is language that's evocative of the scapegoat in the Old Covenant. If you remember Leviticus 18 in particular, where on the Day of Atonement there were two goats that were involved in making atonement and sacrifice for the sins of Israel. And one goat was put to death as a sin offering. Speaking of propitiation of the wrath of God. But the second goat, the sins of Israel, were figuratively by the priest placed upon this goat's head And he was sent far away into the wilderness, signifying the taking away of sin, the removal of sin from his people. And here I think John is wedding those two elements of both the death of Christ satisfying the wrath of God, but also removing sin from his people. This is all coming from the mouth of John the Baptist. John recognizes not only the majesty of Christ's person, that he is to be preferred before anyone else, he recognizes the true nature of his work. That it is a mission of suffering and substitution in the place of his people to reconcile them to God. Notice verse 30. Verse 30, he says, This is he of whom I said. Remember, John has already been preaching for some time. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who is preferred before me, for he was before me. Now, I've already, I've already commented on this. This is actually the third time in chapter 1 alone that we've encountered these words. This is John's refrain that he repeats over and over, humbling himself and exalting Christ. But what is significant here, as he says to the crowds, this is he of whom I said, What's significant here is that unlike the prophets of old, John the Baptist did not only have the uh, uh, the privilege of speaking of Christ coming from afar, but John had the unique privilege of introducing Him in the flesh. You think of the prophets of the Old Testament, Isaiah, Amos, 
Their message was, look for him. Expect the Messiah. Expect the one who's coming. John's message is, behold him. His message is, that this is he of whom I said that he is superior to me. This is the one who has a more significant baptism to offer than I have. And therefore, listen to him. Heed him. Follow him. And though there was no pomp or beauty in Christ, you remember Isaiah 53 verse 2, I believe it is, says that there was in him no beauty that we should desire him. Even though there was no pomp as Christ comes on the scene, John does not waver in his faith. He does not waver in his confession, but more the boldly, uh, all the more boldly holds fast to his original confession that this one, clothed in the frailty of our own flesh, is to be preferred before all others. And so that's his identity of Christ, his identification of Christ, and his description of Christ. But that raises a second question, and this is our second heading under our exposition The second question is this, how did John know that this is the Messiah? How did John know that this was the Lamb of God promised to come? So let us consider this second thing in the the remaining verses, the way that John identified him. Verse 31, John the Baptist says, I had not, I'm going to use my, how I think it should be translated, literally, I had not known him but that he should be revealed to Israel. Therefore, I came baptizing with water. Now, he starts off his confession and his identification of Christ by saying, I had not known him, or I did not know him. And what he's saying there is what, is what we already know, that as far as we know, prior to Jesus' baptism, Jesus and John had no earthly acquaintance with one another. Even though they were related by way of their mother, Uh, Their mothers, they didn't grow up together. Um, Luke 1, verse 80, for instance, tells us that John was in the deserts until the day of his manifestation to Israel. And so John, on the one hand, because he is Isaiah 40, verse 3, the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, he spends his upbringing in the deserts, in obscurity. Meanwhile, Jesus spends his early years in the north, in Nazareth. And you might think to yourself that that doesn't seem to help John's testimony because if he didn't know Jesus, then how can he be assured of his identity? But what John is doing here is he's giving them on even more trustworthy grounds than mere human acquaintance. And he rather roots his identification in divine revelation. By saying here, I had not known him, and he says it twice, John is declaring that his identification of Christ is not merely based on a man's personal evaluation, nor is it some elaborate scheme that two friends kind of secretly conjured up together, but rather he knows that this is the Christ because God revealed it to him. Notice he elaborates in verse 33. He says, I had not known him. Same exact phrase. But he who sent me to baptize with water said to me... Now pause there for a second. Who is that? There was no man who sent John to baptize. This is a reference to God himself. And we're not told by what means God informed him of this, whether it was by a vision or an angel or a voice. It's really besides the point. But John says, the one who sent me to baptize said to me, Upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining on Him, this is He who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And so it becomes clear that God told John of several specific things. I'll give you three. Number one, God sent John to start baptizing with water. That's not an office that John just appointed himself to out of his own wisdom. But secondly, according to verse 31... It was also revealed to John that his ministry of baptizing with water would be the means of revealing the Christ to Israel. And thirdly, God specifically revealed how John would recognize the Messiah. That he would see with his own eyes the Spirit of God descending as a dove and remaining upon the Christ. The important thing for us to to get here is 
is that this testimony John is giving is not merely his own conjecture, but it is based on divine promise. He's not just testifying from mere personal acquaintance or evaluation. He's testifying on the basis of God's fulfilled Word. And that's something that I'll open up in a, in a minute in our doctrine section. I'll just say, say something here. But John is a supreme example of a saint who lived by faith and not by sight. He's, he's a supreme example of one uh, who, as Jesus said, blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. God gave John enough revelation to understand his task, to keep him encouraged in the midst of his work, and God gave him a great expectation. And John lived in faith, by faith, in light of that, declaring to Israel the coming king and the supremacy of Christ, even though John had not yet himself met him. And in due time, God's word did come to pass, and John could say with joy, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John is giving to these crowds and thus through the writing of Scripture to us an eyewitness testimony. Notice the closing verse in verse 34. I have seen and have testified that this is the Son of God. This is not just a second-hand story. John is not saying here that I think I heard somewhere something kind of like this happened to someone. But he's saying, I have seen it. I have seen it. And though everyone in this dark world rejects it and denies it, I cannot and will not deny it. Because this is in truth the Lamb of God. And notice not only does he call Him the Lamb of God, but he testifies in verse 34 that this is the Son of God. Because you remember that John himself, as he put Jesus into the waters of baptism, and as Jesus came up out of the waters and the heavens were opened, John himself heard the voice of the Father saying to them, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. This passage is about God Himself bearing witness to Christ and John the Baptist bearing witness to Christ. His identity is not unclear. He does not come out of obscurity or in obscurity. Rather, he comes to us with deni- undeniable testimony that should arrest our attention and draw out our faith. Let's turn our attention now to the doctrine of the text. Doctrines that are here present in this text that it would be beneficial for us to open up in more detail. I have three things that I want to open up under this section this morning. I'll give them to you as we go. The first one is this. The significance of Christ being baptized by John. The significance of Christ being baptized by John. And I realize, as I said, John does not explicitly record the event of Jesus' baptism, but obviously it's very much bound up with everything John is bearing testimony to here. Jesus' baptism has been something that has perplexed Christians. And indeed, it even perplexed John the Baptist himself. If you remember Matthew chapter 3, John actually protests when Jesus comes to John to be baptized. And John basically would stop him. And John says to him, I have need to be baptized by you, not the other way around. And it's an understandable hesitation because John's baptism was what? A baptism of repentance for the remission of sin. And Jesus has no sin. And Jesus has, therefore, no need of repentance. And so... The question arises, why did Jesus on his own initiative submit himself to John's baptism? And there are at least two main reasons that the Scriptures give us that I just want to briefly say a word about each. First of all, his submitting, Jesus' submitting to John's baptism showed in a clear way Jesus' identification with sinners. Okay? He is not himself sinful but He has come to be the sin bearer. And if you think about it, there are many, many other things that the Lord Jesus submitted Himself to that were not proper for one of His station, and yet He submits to them not because He deserves it, but because His people deserved it. 
And his baptism marks the beginning of his ministry as the great substitute of sinners. It marks the beginning of putting himself in the place of his people. When John protests, John the Baptist, when he protested and said, I have need to be baptized by you, Jesus' only reply was this, permit it now for it is, uh, it is fitting to fulfill all righteousness. Now you think about that. When anyone else stepped into the waters of baptism, it was a confession of personal sin and of personal rebellion against God. But when Christ steps into the waters of baptism, it was a glorious act of righteousness and obedience. He came in the likeness of sinful flesh, Romans 8, and in that state humbled Himself to identify with His people in that state. He consents, as it were, to be counted as if He were a sinner, just as He will at the climax of His obedience when he undergoes an even greater baptism, the baptism of the wrath of his Father. His submitting here to the sinner's baptism is an incredible inauguration and foreshadowing of how Christ came to take the sinner's place. And therefore, it shouldn't be something that offends our senses, but should be something that invites our worship and praise to the glorious One who stoops to identify with me in order to save me. That's the first reason Jesus submits to be baptized by John, is to show his solidarity with the sinner and his coming to take the sinner's place. But the second thing, I'll be a bit more brief. The second reason is that Jesus' baptism was his public inauguration into ministry. Okay, it was his public inauguration into ministry. And this is the element that John's Gospel more focuses on. Uh, John the Baptist says, I was sent to baptize with water in order that He might be revealed to Israel. And that word reveal means to make manifest, to make known. This is the event in which the Father publicly owns the Son as mediator and where the Son receives the public anointing of the Holy Spirit for His ministry. And I'll say more about that point, the relationship of Christ and the Spirit in our next point. But His baptism is the public inauguration into His public work. The Father is setting His seal on His Son and giving to Him His Spirit to be His helper and His companion to complete His mission and His work. Now that brings us to the second point of doctrine. The relationship of the Holy Spirit to Jesus' earthly ministry. The relationship of the Holy Spirit, the person of the Holy Spirit, to the person of the Son in Jesus' earthly ministry. There's something very significant happening here in the descent of the Spirit upon Christ at His baptism. Um, when the Spirit descends visibly as a dove and rests upon Christ at His baptism, that wasn't just done uh, kind of for you know, visual effect for those who are standing by. But rather, Jesus as mediator is being uniquely equipped by the Spirit to fulfill the work that lies ahead of Him. Okay, now, let's thread the needle for a second. To be sure, the person of the Logos, the person of the Word, was never without His Spirit. Right? Just as the Father is never without His Son. So we shouldn't imagine that before this, Jesus was devoid of the Spirit. But this is where we need our categories straight, and we'll open this up a bit this afternoon. In the work of redemption, in history, when the eternal Logos now assumes flesh as mediator, as the God-man, as mediator, He is now receiving the Helper to be equipped for His public ministry. Matthew Henry says that the Spirit came now upon Christ both to make Him fit for His work and to make Him known to the world. Now, why is that significant? I think it's significant for one reason because the role of the Holy Spirit's ministry in the life of Christ is something that is not often emphasized or talked about today. 
It's also significant because it goes to the heart of how we understand Christ's human obedience and how we then imitate Christ in our pursuit of Christian obedience. The Spirit was and is the inseparable companion of Christ in His work as mediator. Too many, too many Christians... And I don't believe they do this maliciously. I don't believe they do this on purpose or anything like that. But many Christians unknowingly diminish the realness of our Lord's true humanity and His human obedience. And therefore, they diminish His rich example as a man who lived in perfect dependence upon the Holy Spirit. And there are many Christians who think of Christ's obedience as though it were performed by some sort of superhuman that was kind of cheating by relying on his divine nature as he acted as the second Adam. But Christ's obedience for us had to be real human obedience in order to be our substitute. And to put it provocatively, Christ did not cheat in his obedience by relying on his divine nature, but rather he obeyed in his humanity by receiving the graces and the help of the Holy Spirit. This is why the miracles of Christ are often attributed to the power of the Holy Spirit. This is why when the Jews uh, told him that he actually does his works uh, by the power of Satan, that's why Jesus doesn't say, you have blasphemed me. He says, you have blasphemed the Holy Spirit whose works they are. This is why uh, the writer to the Hebrews says in Hebrews 9.14 that Christ offered Himself without spot to God through the eternal Spirit. The the Spirit was Christ's closest companion. Isaac Ambrose, a Puritan, said, He received the Spirit without measure. There was in Him as much as possibly could be in a creature and more than in all creatures whatsoever. Whatsoever. And Christian, because Christ possesses the Spirit without measure, He is now able to pour out the Spirit upon His people. That's what it means when He says that He has come to baptize with the Holy Spirit. It, It includes all of the blessings and the graces that the Spirit brings to the people of God. I've mentioned this in the last couple of weeks. I'm not sure which sermon it was. But it's something that we need to continue to kind of fashion in our thinking, there there is no grace that we receive in the Gospel that was not first in Christ Himself. And that is true as well of the gift of the Spirit, the chief of graces. We receive the Spirit from Christ because Christ possesses the Spirit in His fullness And the Spirit who was Christ's companion now becomes our companion in the Christian life. That's why, we'll get to it later in John, that's why He is called the Helper of God's people. That's why He's called the Comforter. And we now live the Christian life in imitation of Christ's life, which was a life lived in communion and and in dependence upon the Spirit. That brings us to the third point of doctrine this morning. The third point of doctrine. The Christian life, like John's, is a life of living by faith in what is promised. Okay? The Christian life, like John's, is a life of living by faith in what is promised. Last week, we considered John's humility. Today, I want to just briefly consider his faith and his trust in the promise of God. This is often overlooked, I think, in terms of the, how John is a model for us. We often emphasize that he's a model of humility, which is certainly true. But a model of a believer before Christ, I think John is also an example of for us. John was called to a lifetime of believing something that he had not seen. He, he says twice here that he had not known Jesus And he spent years waiting for what was promised to come to pass. uh, Come to pass. He believed God's word that what had not been yet manifested to his eyes would be manifested 
And that is the nature of every Christian's experience in the Christian pilgrimage. We, we are not awaiting the first coming of Christ, but we are awaiting still the consummation of all things. As, as we await the fullness of our redemption and the adoption as sons and the renewal of all things and the full eradication of sin and the full presence of Christ with His people, as we await it, we groan inwardly as we await what has been promised. Paul says in Romans 8, 24, for in this hope we were saved. But who, or excuse me, but hope that is not seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Christian, you know as well as I do, there is a lot that is left to be desired in this life. There is, this life is full of hardship, disappointment, suffering. Just like John's life was hard. Living in obscurity, whose end was to have his head presented on a platter. But notwithstanding all of that, God gives us the hope in the midst of it that God's Word will not fail. That there is another world coming. A world in which we will see face to face what we believe now. And like Jacob, remember from our readings in Genesis, Jacob, after he lays eyes upon Joseph for the first time, after he had thought he had been dead for years, Jacob says, now I can die in peace. And I have no doubt that in a similar way, the moment John beheld the face of the Lamb of God and saw the Word become flesh, this world no longer had anything to offer to him. The moment he beheld that vision of beholding God in the flesh, his joy was complete in hearing the bridegroom's voice. And so the Christian waits for the promise of God to be fulfilled. But not only that, God's promise to John that he would see the Christ also put strength in John and gave him resolution in his work. Even though John didn't know all the particulars of exactly how everything would come to pass, the promise that it would come to pass fueled his service and it kept him from despair. It was a hope that kept the fires of his faith aflame. Um, the, The fact that the promise had not yet come to pass didn't dissuade him, but the fact that the promise had been made encouraged him. You remember Pilgrim, uh, Christian from Pilgrim's Progress and how often Christian is given new strength by thinking upon the promise. By thinking upon the celestial city and fixing his eyes on the things to come. Like Christian, like John the Baptist, so we must do in our pilgrimage. And you think about it, John at least as far as we know, had relatively few promises from God to live by. And yet they were enough for him. We have all of the promises of God's Word until the second coming. Promises that give the people of God life and strength and perseverance in their weariness. And finally, just just like John saw the promise come to pass, we can take comfort that we too We'll see, the God, we'll see God's promises come to pass. Matthew Henry says that they who upon God's Word believe what they do not see shall shortly see what they now believe. Christian, be reminded, if nothing else, this morning that God is faithful and that while He does not owe us any of the particulars and He doesn't owe us all of the answers to the questions that we ask, like why this and why not this, God has said that heaven will will make amends for all of it. And everyone who trusts Christ, from the least to the greatest of believers, shall see that promise fulfilled. Just as Christ, by faith, looked to the joy that was set before Him and endured the cross, we as His people are given the great hope of the joy set before us, and God will make good on all of the promises He has made to us. That brings us thirdly to our last section here, our application. 
the application of the text to us. How should we respond? And I have three simple things this morning that I want to apply the, in, in three ways I want to apply this to the Christian. Three things, Christian, for us to take away from this text. Number one, and perhaps most importantly, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And I especially want to speak this morning to the discouraged Christian, the beat up Christian, to the wounded conscience who perhaps this week has felt more of the vileness of sin than you have seen evidences of God's grace in your life. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. What this crowd got to behold with their eyes, we are called to behold by faith. And it's at the very heart of the Gospel. We are commanded to behold one who came outside of us who was baptized in solidarity with our sinfulness, though He was not sinful, to look to one who was persecuted and suffered at the hands of men, not because He deserved it, but because we deserved it, and to look to the one who was crucified to take away our sins. How often our eyes need to be drawn afresh to the one who loved us and gave Himself for us. And you might be here as a Christian with a smitten conscience. And you hear that and you're reasoning with yourself. But I've got too much sin to take that as a comfort right now. And the, I fear that the amount of sin in my life proves that I am not a partaker, a partaker of His grace. And therefore, the one who was crucified must not have been crucified for me. You need to understand there is a vast difference between the high-handed sinner who sins without regret and the smitten conscience of a broken believer. It's true, if you're here this morning and you're unrepentant in your sin and you lack any godly sorrow and you lack any wish that you should be rid of your sin, you do have cause for concern. But Christian, in my experience, the one who is mourning over his sin and as a result of that mourning actually despairs of grace is actually showing signs of grace. And what you need to be reminded of is that there is no qualification for looking to Christ. There's no standard that the sinner has to meet in order to behold Him. You remember Peter was a believer and yet denied the Lord three times. And he wept, and he looked to Christ again, and he was restored. That is a picture of the Christians relating to Christ through the Gospel. If you're here and you're smitten in conscience over your sins, remember that every single saint who has been taken into glory was still a sinner just moments before before they entered paradise. Sin is not a hindrance to beholding Christ. Your sin is the very reason why God has given a Christ. And so don't stop at the sight of your sin, but bring your sins to a merciful Christ and apply the Gospel. Do you suppose that there has ever been a godly saint who didn't mourn over their remaining corruption? The more godly someone is, the more they mourn over their remaining corruption. Even the holiest of saints know that they have nothing to rest their burdened souls upon at the end of the day but a Christ who takes away the sin of the world. And so first and foremost, behold the Lamb of God. Secondly, live by the Spirit. Second point of application, live by the Spirit. Paul tells us in Galatians, Walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the lusts of the flesh. We walk as Christians by the Spirit because Christ walked by the Spirit. He is our pattern and our guide in our sanctification. And Christian, what an inexhaustible fountain of life there is to be found in the possession of the very Spirit of Christ dwelling within our hearts. 
The Father and the Son together have sent the gift of the Holy Spirit into the hearts of their people to be their helper and their comforter. Think about that. The same companion who accompanied Christ in all of His obedience and helped Christ is the same companion who dwells in our hearts. Directing and enlightening and convicting and assuring and strengthening. Christian, we need to learn to trust God not only for our justification and our right standing with God, we do trust Him for that, but we also need to learn to trust in His promised provision of grace through the companion of the Holy Spirit. We dare not seek to try to be like Christ without depending on the Spirit's power and influence. Just as Christ didn't enter into His public ministry until He was anointed by the Spirit, so He told His church, you remember, tarry in Jerusalem until you receive the gift of the Spirit. Because it is the Spirit that enlivens the church. That gives life to the Christian. Gives strength to the Christian. And so Christian, I want to just give you the simple reminder, walk in Him. Walk by Him. In your fight against temptation, look to the Spirit for help. In your time of need for strength and comfort, look to Him. In your season of weariness, look to Him. In all of your lack, which we have much of, look to the Spirit. He is the fountain of living water, as Jesus will say in chapter 7, poured out upon His church for their nourishment and strength and growth. And then lastly, final application. Live by faith. Live by faith. Grab hold, Christian, of the sure Word of God as John did. Let the encouragement of God's promises and His trustworthiness give you strength. There are many things to us that are yet unseen. There are many things to us in in the Christian life that are uncertain, but in the midst of all of life's uncertainties, there is one thing that remains fixed, and that is the Word of God. It does not change It is not altered and it does not fail. And His promises will come to pass. Heaven and earth will pass away, but My words will never pass away. And though you do not now see, you are called as a Christian to believe. Imitate the believers mentioned in Hebrews 11, who though they did not receive in this life the things that were promised, Yet they looked forward to a city whose builder and founder was God. He has told us now that it will be so. And like John the Baptist, one day we will with great joy say, I have seen with my own eyes the Lord do it. There will come a day for every believer in which we will say, no longer do I merely hope for what was coming, but I see that for which I hoped. Christian, faith is never vain when it is placed in God's Word. Christ shall come a second time as He came the first time. And He will come and He will right every wrong. And He will restore every loss. And He will reward His people with the gift of heaven. A gift of whose joy we cannot even begin to conceive. And so let us, Christian, take courage on our short journey here, our short pilgrimage. Let us be encouraged in our labor that eternal rest and satisfaction awaits all of those who eagerly await the coming of Christ and the promise of God being fulfilled. Amen. Let us pray together. Father, we pray that You would write Your Word upon our our hearts. Lord, we pray that You would give us strength. Pray that You give us greater faith in Your Word and in the promises that You have given to Your people.
Lord, so many of them have you given in order to strengthen faith. Lord, in order to encourage us as we walk the weary path of the Christian life and carrying the cross. Father, we thank you for your kindness and your goodness. We thank you, Lord, for the example of John the Baptist. We thank you even more for the greater one who came after him. The one in whom dwells the Spirit of God without measure. The one who gives to us the blessed Spirit. Father, we pray for greater measures of your Spirit. That he would come and dwell within our hearts. That he would cause sin in our hearts to be eradicated and removed. That he would work within us those gracious blessings of growing in the likeness of Christ. Lord, we pray that all of the virtues that, were in, that are in Christ would more and more be formed in us. Father, help us to grow in love and patience and peace, honesty, truthfulness, trustworthiness, faithfulness. Lord, we know that our sins are many and we thank You that Your mercy is more. We pray, Lord, that You would draw near to us this day we pray that you'd bless our fellowship and our conversations as a church together as we enjoy a meal together. Father, bless our time. We pray that we would, Lord, that we would prize the time together of gathering as a church. Lord, help us to forgive one another. We pray that if anyone has anything against another, that, Lord, they would walk in the gospel. Cause us, Lord, to lay down the arms of pride that cause us to withhold forgiveness. Help us, Lord, to confess our sins and to forgive one another as You have forgiven us in Christ. Lord, bless our communion together. Lord, bless our fellowship, we pray. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand for a minute.